Years back, Ajahn Suwa was invited to give a retreat at a meditation center in Massachusetts, the purpose being to introduce the people there to traditions of the forest in Thailand. And I remember halfway through the retreat, the person who organized the retreat came to me and said, okay, everybody's been doing samatha, tranquility practice, now it's time to switch to vipassana. And I tried to explain to him that the forest tradition doesn't make that clear a distinction between the two. You're trying to do the two of them together. Because what are you going to learn from insight? Well, one, insight, as far as the Buddha was concerned, was not a technique. It was a quality of mind that you're trying to develop. And you don't wait until your concentration gets really strong, or you don't wait until halfway through a retreat and say, it's time to switch. If you're paying attention to what you're doing as you get the mind to settle down, that's where the insight comes. Look at the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation. As you discern short breathing, long breathing, you train yourself to breathe sensitive to the entire body, and then you calm bodily fabrication. Now bodily fabrication there means the in and out breath. The question is, why does he use a technical term when he could simply say, calm the in and out breath? And the reason is because he wants you to see the extent to which you are actually fabricating the breath. The same in the second tetran. Learn how to breathe in and out sensitive to rapture in the body, breathe in and out sensitive to pleasure. These things don't happen on their own. You have to observe what kind of breathing is going to make you feel refreshed, energized. That's what's meant by the rapture. What kind of breathing is going to be pleasant, easeful? You have to explore. And as you do that, you begin to realize that these feelings that you're giving rise to do depend on perceptions. And the two of them, perceptions and feelings, are fabricating the shape of your mind, the state of your mind. And then you try to calm that fabrication. So you've got both the topics of tranquility, i.e. calming the mind, calming the breath, and the topics of insight seeing things in terms of fabrication. It's a matter of getting sensitive to what you're doing. That's where the insight comes. Even with the five aggregates, the Buddha's analysis of suffering starts out with aging, illness, and death, being separated from what you like, being forced to stay with what you don't like not getting what you want. All these are things that we know. Sorrow, limitation, pain, distress, despair. We know these things. But then he says, what makes them all suffering, what makes them all stressful, what they all have in common, is five clinging aggregates. This is where it gets unfamiliar. So you learn the names of the aggregates. Form is the form of your body. Feelings are feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Perceptions are the labels you put on things, the images you hold in mind. They tell you what something is and what it means. Thought fabrications are intentions and just your inner conversation. Then consciousness is aware of all these things. You can learn the words. But where do you find them? Where do these things happen? Actually, they're happening all the time. And you're going to see them as you try to get the mind to settle down. The things that distract you are usually perceptions and thought fabrications, although sometimes they're pains. That's three aggregates right there. And if you learn how to comprehend them, learn how not to get distracted by them. For example, with pain. In the Buddha's analysis of pain, it, it can be 
conjoined with lots of different things. It can be conjoined with certain perception. It can be conjoined with the way you talk to yourself. So when there's a pain that's disturbing you, ask yourself how you're talking to yourself about it. First thing to say is, I don't have to be there with the pain. It can have some other part of the body. I'm going to be someplace else. If there's a pain in your hip, you can focus on your knee or your chest. Any place in the body where you can make the sense of the breath comfortable as it comes in, as it goes out. So you're talking to yourself about the pain in a new way, and you're perceiving it in a new way. Realizing you don't have to go there. You don't have to lay claim to that part of the body. And you don't have to clamp down on the pain to prevent it from moving. And then when you have a good, solid foundation in a comfortable part of the body, then you can look at the pain. First, see if you can think of that sense of comfort flowing in through the pain as you breathe in, as you breathe out. Then if you're one, you can focus directly on the pain itself. Because one of the reasons why pain is so bad is because we're afraid of it. And we think well, we're afraid of it because it's so bad, but actually the fear can make it worse. To tell yourself, I'm going to investigate this pain. And particularly you want to see what perceptions do you have around the pain that make it make inroads on your mind. The perception that it's identical with a part of your body. The knee or the hip feels like it's all pain. What is it? Part of your sensation of the hip is in the four elements of earth, water, wind, and fire. There's solidity, liquidity, warmth, energy. Those things are not the pain. The pain is something else. Can you see the difference? Or where is the most intense point of the pain? Does it stay in the same place? Well, no. Chase it around for a while. Show that you're not afraid. And as you do this, you begin to see that the way you perceived the pain, the way you talked to yourself about the pain, was a large part of the problem. So there you are, perceptions, fabrications. Learn how to take the distraction apart in terms of these things. It allows you to free yourself from them, and you get hands-on experience with what the Buddha means when he says feeling, perception, thought, fabrication, form, consciousness. The same goes for thought distractions. If you're angry about something, you can ask yourself, what are the perceptions you have around that? How do you talk to yourself around the anger? How are you breathing around the anger? Can you change the way you do things? Talk to yourself in a way that's still true, but is pointing out different things that make you see that the, the issue is not worth anger, or if it really is something really wrong. You're getting angry about it is not going to help you see what should be done. This way you begin to realize the extent to which you put your present experience together through these aggregates. Even your sense of self is made out of these aggregates. So actually they're closer to you than your sense of who you are. They are the activities you're engaging in. And you see them not only when you're trying to deal with distractions, but also as you try to get the mind to settle down. Because after all, you're focused on the breath. What is that form? Feelings. You're trying to give rise to a feeling of ease, pleasure, refreshment. Perception. What's the image you have of the breath as it flows in the body? What I image would be best, most conducive to a sense of ease and well-being? Thought fabrications, your intention to stay here, and then on top of that, you talk to yourself. Does the breath feel good? Yes. Well, if it feels good, how to maintain that? And as you maintain that, how do you get it to spread around the body so it feels thoroughly saturated with this good breath energy? And then consciousness is aware of all these things. This is how you learn about these, these aggregates, is by doing the path. 
because you encounter them as you're doing it. And as you reflect on what you're doing, that's how you gain insight. It's not the case that tranquility is one thing and, and insight practice is something else. The qualities of mind, as I said, tranquility is the ease, calm, stillness that comes as you try to focus in, get the mind settled in. Insight is when you begin to see things in terms of fabrication, the way you put things together in the present moment. Now you can learn how to relate to those fabrications in a way where you can see their drawbacks, see where they can be made good, but how far does that goodness go? This is something we're trying to pursue. So it's in doing the duty of the Fourth Noble Truth that you do the duties of the first and the second. And ultimately the idea, the ideal is that you end up doing the duty with the third as well. This is why John Lee, when he talks about awakening, doesn't talk about seeing things in terms of the three characteristics. It's seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Because with the Four Noble Truths, you have to reflect. What am I doing? The three characteristics don't necessarily have you reflect. Trees are in constant. Buildings are in constant. This cell that we're in right now, it actually was built to be in constant, impermanent. It was supposed to be just a quick sketch before we get some money to build a real sala. And here it is, thirty-some years later. Well, now we're told that it's going to be torn down in a couple weeks. Those things are in constant. But what does that tell us about us? Because after all, the Four Noble Truths point out the fact that the reason we're suffering is because of something we're doing. We're not suffering because things outside are impermanent. Are impermanent. If that were the cause, even our hunts would suffer. It's not the case that their form, feelings, etc., become permanent when they gain awakening. No, they learn to realize the problem is the clinging. The clinging is what you're doing. And you're going to see that clearly as you deal with distractions and concentration. And as you're doing the concentration itself, this is why when the Buddha introduced his son to the practice, one of the first images he used was a mirror. Just as you use a mirror to reflect on your face, you look at your actions to reflect on what's going on in your in your mind, what you're doing right now, because that is the problem. So learn to reflect. Notice what you're doing, what you could do better. As you try to get the mind to settle down, and as you see, this is a process of fabrication. The path is of something fabricated. Stress, suffering, that's fabricated. The cause of suffering is fabricated. It's fabricated through your actions. So reflect. So the Buddha said, the Dharma is nourished by committing yourself to the practice and then reflecting on what you're doing. Think about what a mirror meant back in those days, the way you can see things you ordinarily wouldn't see. You go through life without a mirror, you can't see your eyes, you can't see your nose, you can't see your mouth. You have a mirror, you can see things you wouldn't see otherwise. Well, the Dharma is like that. Learn to use your actions as your mirror. That's the Dharma mirror. That's when you see what you really need to see, and when you see it, then you can do something about it. <laughs>